Welcome you to our first session. Um, I do want to remind you if you're getting CEUs that you've signed in. Um, also, please remember to keep uh, breaks to a minimum. You do have to be here for the full session in order to earn the CEUs. Um, so if you do need to, you need to use the restroom and please return quickly. Um, you'll also need to sign out at the conclusion of the session. I will collect your session evals and I will punch your CEU card. Um, I do want to welcome Hawk Robinson today. He'll be presenting on the therapeutic and educational use of role-playing games as intervention modalities for individuals and groups from a therapeutic recreation perspective. Um, he is a previous student of mine, so I'm very excited and, and pleased to have him here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. So I guess my name's Hawk Robinson, um, and uh, I've also been in role-playing gaming as well as a student in therapeutic recreation. I'm still an undergraduate senior and uh, working through that process I'll cover more detail in a minute. So the session is going to provide all as much background and research information as we can fit into the time allotted on the effects of role-playing games on participants. Uh, it's going to also address a lot of the inculcated um, concepts that people have about role-playing games and gamers and some of the history leading up to that uh, because it's still a factor for a number of people. Um, we, uh, there's going to be coverage of both the benefits and potential caveats. Okay? Like everything, we need to have a balance to it. And different aspects of role-playing gaming have different strengths and weaknesses. So all forms of role-playing games will be covered. Choose your own adventure, tabletop, live action, and computer-based. And I will go through and explain each of those, how they're different, and how they could be used in a therapeutic recreation setting. Um, in addition to understanding how to use them in a normal setting, so people just playing them diversionally, we'll also try to figure out how to use them in a PR setting, and I have some specific uh, client examples that we've done uh, in classes with Emily and such, uh, a little bit for LARP, and then some hypothetical ones that we went through the whole program planning process, but I haven't had a chance to actually implement yet. But they can at least give you some ideas of how we're looking at in a PR setting. So, examples of each format in a typical setting and then with existing research using it for educational and therapeutic interventions from other disciplines education psychiatry psychology there have been about 70 or 80 studies or so doing that and then as I said illustrate it specifically for a PR application and so meeting the CEU requirements you should be able to and at the end and there'll be a quick just verbal quiz at the end Identify and explain each existing research indicating the pros and cons of each RPG format when they're used in their standard diversionary forms. Identify and explain examples of specific areas that non-adapted RPGs can directly achieve TR-related client outcomes just by participating in the activity. Some of the specific populations that could benefit from TR-based RPG intervention programs. Uh, examples of specific areas where TR methodologies can be applied to tweak the RPG experience to target more specific areas, and then areas that still need more research. So I'm not going to go over all of that, don't worry. But I'm an undergrad student at Eastern Washington, as I said, uh, interdisciplinary degree, though. So not just straight TR. It's recreation therapy, music therapy, neuroscience, and research psychology. I'm a part-time student, so this is taking me for Ever. <laughs> I'm a full-time par single parent of three teenage boys. Oh. I was in computer science for a lot of years, did well in that career, was able to come home in 2003 to raise my kids full-time, fortunately. And then I've been looking ahead, well, when they all fly the coop, what am I going to do with the next stage of my life? And so this is where I'm going to go with the TR. And, and then, so the, the main focus will be TR and music therapy, but bringing in neuroscience and research psychology to help uh, support those therapies. I do plan to sit for the NC PRC CTRS as soon as I finish all my requirements. Hopefully next year, be on top of that, do the internship and everything. Meanwhile, I keep volunteering at different places as much as I can. And I did have my last TR class with Emily just this last quarter, now I'm finishing off my psych classes. Uh, there will be, uh, this is recorded, and this video will be uploaded to the RPGResearch.com website, and will be on the YouTube.com forward slash RPG Research so you can check it out later if you want to reference some material that went by. And there's a lot of other videos there as well. I think there's 70 or 80 different ones over the years I've added to. 
just I'm going to skim through this quickly, but my computer background is I, I did actually have a whole career uh, prior to the, the TR world, but it led me to this. Um, I also worked in the automotive industry as an ambulance automotive instructor uh, at junior college. Lots and lots of techie stuff, um, associates in computer science, lots of certifications, and yet I still was, I was able to be chief technology officer, chief information officer for some dot coms, and then I did work for Fortune 500. So TR relevant background, years ago, before I went fully into the computer career, I did work as a nurse's aide, I was going through the LPM training program, these were in Utah, and uh, also a habilitation therapist for, back then the term was MR, now it's V, and whatever the term is, but a long-term care facility. And uh, really did enjoy that, um, but wasn't in, in place to pursue it at the time. Also, lots of other volunteer work related. And covered that membership, and uh, I did register as a recreation therapist, even though I'm not billable yet to start the process. But I'm not yet certified, just to be clear. Okay, and part of the reason for the computer background is one of my businesses was computer training school, and I started getting parents bringing in their ADD, ADHD kids, uh, mostly high schoolers, who were apparently like taking apart the computers in class and being distracted, not doing very well. And they came to me asking if there was anything I could do to help them focus on their homework. <laughs> one of the simplest one was a typing class. He just was never doing the typing in class. So I found some online video games that were typing games. And what do you know? He suddenly shot ahead on typing. And so as that kind of progressed, I was looking at maybe child psychology and such. And some psychology friends of mine said, uh, look at alternative therapies. They, they knew me. I didn't want to do that much paperwork. And they <laughs> thought maybe alternative therapies would be interesting. That's how I stumbled across both therapy for acting and music therapy, which have a lot of parallels in their origins. Uh, what's funny is the, uh, a lot of the books in the TR world, I find mirrors in the music therapy world, too. You can go through and like the categories are the same. A lot of terminology is the same for program plan. <laughs> But if you look at their history, a lot of them, you know, the hospitals, World War One and Two, they kind of evolved together. A lot of you who do TR, I hear, do a lot of music therapy uh, in conjunction. So, ties together. So, role playing game background. I was first introduced to D&D in 1979 by a cousin. Uh, played it intermittently, um, and then by the time I was about 12 or 13, uh, was playing it fairly frequently, weekends and such, or in the summer more. Uh, did other activities too, was out going on camping trips and all sorts of other things, but this was a favorite pastime. I started to become a regular game master, that's the person who kind of runs the games in 84, hosted my first little conventions in 85, 86, 87, right around there. Uh, first one had 12 people, second one had about 50 people, so you know, it was still small, but and they were officially role-playing game association sanctioned little conventions. And I now apparently run Tolkien centric, so the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings annual convention in Spokane. And it's still, yeah, I keep it small, it's about 30 or so people. Plus, it's simulcast over the web and has an interactive audience. And uh, do that every year for fans of J.R. Tolkien and his works and such. And also, I was nominated to take over the meetup group last year for the local gaming group. I've done some work with uh, Neuroeducation, which is a facility. Uh, a business in downtown Spokane who really tries to use it, you know, buzzwords now is evidence-based, but you know, use a lot of science uh, for evaluation of ADD, ADHD, all sorts of learning uh, disabilities, etc. and then implement program plans to help compensate and use their strengths to compensate for any areas that need it. Uh, great program there, plus they were doing bio and neural feedback and that kind of brought me into that area of interest as well. Uh, volunteer work, thanks to uh, Emily and EWU through pro, uh, ASD Toddlers in uh, Cheney there. Unfortunately, that program closed, hasn't it? Yeah, and that was around 10 years or so, wasn't it? Uh, then more recently, there's a Tacoma project with ASD youth and adults that's still underway, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Quick list and music therapy, and also some play therapy. So, a little audience participation here, of course, challenge by choice. Uh, when I say role-playing game, 
raise your hand and, and I'll pick some of you to say what comes to mind. I think of LARPing, live action role playing at okay. the park. <laughs> Describe that verbally for people who are not familiar. Like, what would that look like? Well, I'm not super familiar with it right. either. But, but what's um, the visual? The, vi the visual, um, I don't know, people running around the park, maybe in some cool costumes with like some foam weapons or right. something. Right. <laughs> yep, that's that's one of that's one of anybody else, some other uh what when I say role playing game, what comes to your mind? I think of D and D, so it was at the tabletop. Okay, so you think of tabletop. What does that mean? Um you think so there's of that? like a dungeon master that like leads a quest right. that you have to explore and fight animals like uh dragons mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff. And are they acting that out? No, you're sitting and you're okay. rolling dice and it's all right. about what dice you get. Okay, I just I'm trying to get a feel for the, the knowledge over here. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Oh, I play a Star Wars RPG game on the computer where you get to pick and kind of choose your own adventure with that. Right, and it's computer based. Is that solo or online? You can do either way. Okay. But mostly solo. Okay. okay. All right. So as I mentioned earlier a little bit of the four formats, and we're going to show you each of them. Uh, those are three of the four formats, and and those are pretty typical responses. It's computer based. It's, it, they think of tabletop. It's usually D and D. And then live action is usually costumes beating each other for foam swords. <laughs> <laughs> usually there's some other adjectives thrown in that may not be as positive sometimes, but you know, that varies. Raise your hand if you've ever, I know three of you have, or at least you have, uh, raise your hand if you've just played any kind of RPG before. It's computer based, live action, tabletop, two different. Okay, so we have about seven or eight, okay. Usually when I say it, that's pretty much the response when I ask what it is. Many are not aware of the tabletop version nowadays. It used to be in the 80s and 90s that was what everybody thought of, but they usually mix it in with LARP. They conflated it. Now a lot it's shifted a lot more to the computer-based version. A lot of people think it's computer games or dressing up, and they forget completely about the tabletop. No one can help you. You must face the comment section alone. Let's see what you guys had to say about D&D. So in general, a ton of amazing stories about people learning about themselves and their friends and their community through playing tabletop games. If you ever needed any inspiration on why to start playing tabletop games, last week's comment thread is the place to find it. So thank you for sharing. RPG Research says that they are actually doing research to figure out whether or not the claims that were made in last week's video are true and says that they have a bunch of data and figures and stuff to back it up. So if you're interested, you should check that out. So that's the PBS Idea Channel. And they talk, they cover all sorts of different topics. And uh, some time ago, they covered Dungeons and Dragons. I recommend checking out the video clip. He sums it up really beautifully in about ten minutes, uh, with lots of humorous little video clips and, and pieces that he brings in. Uh, that is included for those who do have a packet. And again, this will be online uh, if you want to check it out later. So unfortunately, for some reason, the video playing there it doesn't show up through the projector. So I think I have about three or four video clips. So there have been about 70 studies, actually, depending upon your definition of a study. Uh, there, you, some would say 100 or 200, but being a little more strict about it, that it was maybe published by a peer-reviewed journal or through a university, or some little more structure to it. About 70 studies since 79, up through the 90s, and then a few in the 2000s that kind of slowed down, except for computer games. For video games, research there has really been taking off. And uh, just studying the relationship there and the impact of role-playing games on participants in general. What these different studies have found is, and this was more tabletop, but some of this you can extrapolate into the other forms. Much of the time we'll use RPG to represent tabletop role-playing gaming. There's programs for foreign language skills that people have used it to help with getting into the setting of a foreign setting and then by, because we know any of you study language, you know that immersion is a much more effective way to take on the language. So by role playing a scenario, let's say in Paris or something, um, and then adding some more structure to it, they found that it was more effective in helping learn foreign language skills. Uh, child behavior, there's a whole bunch of studies about using role playing games to help with social skills, cooperative problem solving, anger management, just general behavioral management, following the rules, uh, and doing it in a fun way because the games by their nature are full of rules, and you use those rules to achieve goals, and the kids become excited about that. They need to follow the rules to get to their next level or their treasure, etc. These are pretty well known. Since there's math and reading and creative thinking, cooperative play, there's tons and tons of research supporting that. Uh, doing baselines, 
Uh, but here's, here's one little thing. This is what I'm trying to add to in, in my research. Most of these are correlative to gamers and non-gamers. They haven't established very effectively except in very small uh, amounts, like small numbers of people or individual case studies, causality. So they find all these things, and, and they do find it okay for educational. Like educational seems to work pretty well. But when we start to get into the therapeutic uh, area, we find that gamers will have certain variables and non-gamers have another variable, but they haven't established fully whether playing the game led them to have those variables, as we'll cover more. So that's causality versus correlation. So a lot of correlative studies, just a little bit of causal. So just as knowing some of the history, development, societal issues of TR, you know, in TR a lot of times we have to prove ourselves to other professions that there's a value to it. That it some people want that hard science. You know, neuroscience is great because you have the neuroimaging and the mapping and you can see the brain changes and people like that tangible thing. And just like psychology, in its early years, TR, and for, for some of the good reasons, uh, TR has you know, had to kind of fight against some of those sociological viewpoints about play and recreation <coughs> and leisure and how can that be useful? That's a waste of time. So, that's been evolving and changing and improving. Well, it's kind of the same thing for RPG. There's a lot of uh, conceptions about role-playing games and, and what they are and what their impact is. So we're gonna cover a little bit of the history just to kind of see how it came to be where it is now. So 72 and 74, a unique cooperative social recreational activity known as role-playing game was created. It was been in the Midwest and the grandfather of all role-playing games, tabletop game Dungeons Dragons was created. Now the roots go far back to ancient history uh, with wargaming. As long as there's been organized warfare, there appears to have been some form of wargaming. There's lots of evidence over the eons of using these things to track the military forces and such and to try to train generals to be and such. And so but that's usually just reserved for the military and maybe the noble elite. And, um, and you see also simplified versions of chess and Chinese game Go, Wu Qian, I think is the original name before it was Go. And, um, but it doesn't have things like terrain, weather, and other, other unpredictable factors. H.G. Wells author of The Time Machine, The Invisible Man, and War of the Worlds, which number of movies have been made. He yeah, was known as novelist, journalist, socialist, uh, sociologist, and historian. And he actually had a huge impact. He came out with a book in 1913 called Little Wars that made wargaming accessible to the general public. So it wasn't just the military and uh, you know, the wealthy that could do it. Still, you know, you'd have to be able to afford to buy and build things. So they were still kind of a little upper crust initially, but it made it accessible in simple terms. Basically, if you had little tin, tin soldiers and boxes and stuff like that, you could slowly add and build and, and do that. And this is actual, you know, the English novelist playing an indoor war game, and, th and this was him at the outdoor one earlier. So it was interesting to see that back then in their nice seats and everything. <laughs> Moving forward to the 30s through the 60s, the Hobbit came out in the 30s, and then in the 60s, The Lord of the Rings, well, it was 13 years later, The Lord of the Rings came out, so it really took off in the 60s, especially the U.S. and, and, and British uh, culture just jumped on board. You had Button saying Frodo lives, and Stephen spray paint, and said Kiljoy was here, or Kilroy was here, you would have uh, Frodo lives and such. And um, depending upon your generation and gender and order and region, uh, a lot of people list Lord of the Rings as second only to the Bible as their most influential book in their lives. Um, there is a gender difference. For guys, it seems to be more Lord of the Rings. For women, it seems to be more for Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a more recent thing, though, before the 90s, that wasn't on the list. <laughs> and especially Harry Potter for the millennials, it kind of supplanted Lord of the Rings in a way. So, war gamers were inspired by Tolkien's works. And so they wanted to kind of include elements from that fantasy type setting. And so some of the war gamers came up with their own rules modifications to include uh, mythical creatures and magic and also individuals like their favorite general or something instead of whole army units 
take that as individual. And that started to lead into role playing games. Dungeons and Dragons was released in 74, it was pretty much self published. They were stapling it in their house, mailing it out. It was word of mouth only at conferences and then little newsletters for gamers. Very, very small, but it went up exponentially. Each, each month it was going up exponentially and growing. Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson were the creators of D&D. They have both recently passed. Um, and as I said, initially it was word of mouth, but pretty soon they were selling millions and millions of copies. The 80s were the golden age of tabletop role-playing games. That was really when it, it reached its peak in popularity. The US population was you know, considerably less than it is now, the 330 million there is now. And there were 20, 30 million tabletop role-playing gamers in the U.S. alone, at least. That's mostly D&D, &D, but there are many, many others. Uh, it's really hard to estimate because they're so reusable. It's not like a computer game where they can track you or a live action game where you're out visible. Usually this takes place in your own home, and you can use them over and over and over. You buy a couple books and then you play on it, definitely. So it's hard to track. But unfortunately, it was at the same time as the satanic panic or moral panic of the 80s. And that was when they were attacking continuing to attack, but really ramped up, uh, you know, with evil, mu you know, music is evil, rock and roll is, bad, you know, bad for you. Uh, you know, violence in uh, TV and just the beginnings of video games, uh, you know, really bad. Um, and then role-play gaming, it really fixated on attacking role-play games there for a while. The backlash was so significant that the company TSR, <laughs> that made D&D, changed their covers to be less demonic, if you will. I mean, that's just a statue, but... Um, so they literally, they literally were trying to change it to try to, but it didn't make any difference to the people that were saying the, the dangers of role-playing games, which we'll get into a little bit. There are hundreds, maybe thousands, of different tabletop role-playing games. Basically, if you've read a book, uh, watched a movie, seen a TV show, and you know, it really kind of caught on or stuck with you, or a comic book, etc., there's probably a role-playing game for it or some adaptation for it. Um, so there's many, many others out there besides D&D. In fact, a few years ago, D&D actually fell to number two below a competitor for a little while. A few others. So D&D is mostly sword and sorcery type fantasy, uh, but there are many other uh, genres. Uh, you, have, you have science fiction. I have some examples over here of Doctor Who and Star Wars and Star Trek and Firefly, uh, Game of Thrones. That's back to fantasy area, but still for those of you familiar with it. Um, Supernatural, literally, like the show Supernatural has a role-playing game. Um, there's biblical role-playing games. There's a, a Christian one, which was all about uh, growing and supporting Christian values in role-playing games, even though there were Christian groups attacking role-playing games. <laughs> At the same time, there were others who were saying, no, 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 it, 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 this isn't so bad. So they adapted it. And like, Auto Duel was an adaptation of Car Wars, which is kind of the road warrior Mad Max type setting. By the way, if you have any questions, Feel free to raise your hand as, as we go through here. Um, although hopefully I'll address. Yes. I don't know if you're going to address this later, but I'm slightly confused about the difference between just like a like a video game and mm -hmm. a role playing game. Yeah, and we will definitely okay. cover that. I will I will sit down and we'll cover each one. So, uh, as I said, it's a little hard to track the numbers, but in the 80s they estimated around 20 or 30 million people just D and D alone, and then there's all those other products, and that's just the U.S. It hasn't really caught on in other countries. Yet. Uh, as the 90s and such progressed, other countries have kind of gotten kind of popular. They thought they'd be happy to sell 50,000 copies, so it definitely took off more than expected. Since then, Israel is, is very popular, different parts of Europe in different years, and even South America, like Brazil and such. There was a, a guy who came in and talked to government agencies and helped him sponsor it in schools and such to bring it up uh, in popularity. And now he's moving to Japan to try to do the same thing. That's his mission. And he's a PhD in sociology. Uh, so then, around the 90s, some hybrid games started to evolve from the tabletop version. LARP was just starting to get set. There were some video games, but they were not the greatest. Um, collectible card games, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, all of those. But it started with, really, Magic the Gathering. And this was much more profitable for the game companies than the role-playing gaming, because those you have to keep buying and they put new issues and the old ones become obsolete so it's a little bit more of a money racket. But they did come from the RPG world. They use the books and terminology and everything from that in their settings. So they diversified into collectible card games, solo computer games, massive multiplayer online role playing games, 
persistent online world, multi-user, there's all these different variants, uh, many, many variations. They've had a lot of ups and downs in the industry, so that's part of why it's been different to diversify. Uh, TSR was absorbed by Wizards of the Coast, which has been absorbed by Hasbro, and now it just continues under Hasbro. Most of the other companies are small companies, 30 employees or one employee, it varies quite a bit. So percentage-wise, a little interesting things have been happening since the economic downturn. Video game sales kind of flattened them and dropping a little bit. And keep in mind, they, they're certainly up here. But tabletop sales of all games, including role-playing games, have been going up double digits in sales ever since, and it's still continuing, uh, even though things are not quite as top sturdy. And there's a lot of different theories. Some are that just the, the expense of video games. Um, some it's that maybe a backlash. We're doing so much free time. Maybe it's nice to get a little bit more of that social stuff. I also think Will Wheaton has had an impact. Those of you who remember the old Star Trek Next Generation, he has a show called uh, Tabletop, and he will bring in uh, other fellow actors and sometimes you know, actual stars to play the games. And what happens is the next day, uh, stores all over the country, hobby stores, will sell out of that product. He's actually had an impact on the market. So now they, when they know what he's going to cover, they hurry and try to stock up on the product in advance. Uh, so lots of different theories what, why that might be happening. Uh, if you want a lot more detail, there is a four-volume set. There was originally one volume, this, but there's a four-volume set on the entire history, each decade, of the evolution of role-playing games and different ones. And it's, it's very detailed by Shannon uh, Fine. The four-volume set was uh, Kickstarter-funded, and I'll just donate to this well. And it's very, very useful if you want to really get into it. And for, for those who are older, it's some great nostalgia too, <laughs> and it gives you a new perspective. You didn't realize what was going on at the time. So, starting for through the 80s, role-playing games really grew in popularity for adults and youth in tens of millions of people. And in the 80s, initially, it was just a game. Actually, in the beginning scene of E.T., where they're is coming into the kitchen and the kids are around their the table, the boys are playing the game there. They're playing uh, basically Dungeons and Dragons. They're using miniatures and everything, but they're playing basically playing media. It was just a game. It wasn't a big deal. Um, it was just something that they were enjoying on a Saturday. But some movement began to develop against role-playing games. Um, and it was it has become popular with children anywhere from grammar school on up. Not so with a lot of adults who think it's been connected to a number of suicides and murders. The idea of the game, which is played by highly imaginative and intelligent kids, is to assume the role of one of the characters. One Irving game. Bink Pulling, 16, an avid D&D &D player, a suicide. She felt so strongly that it was responsible for her son's death that she formed a network of concerned people to warn others about the dangerous aspects of the game. Because of her involvement with D&D, &D, Mrs. Pulling is often consulted by police departments around the country. It's because they believe the game has been involved in a number of murders and suicides. What do you think of uh, people who play... called Dungeons and Dragons that literally destroyed people's lives. I mean, they got into this thing and they were almost even like demonic. That was in 2012. So it hasn't gone away. It's still going on. Amazing. <laughs> so time after time, I have run into people quoting as fact, role-playing gamers were murdered in university steam tunnels by a dungeon master that took the game too seriously. Any of you ever heard that? No? Nobody here? Okay, I've run into it in 15 different states. <laughs> so, uh, but it never actually happened. It was a TV movie with Tom Hanks called Mazes and Monsters, where he plays a player who gets too carried away and then turns it into live action, and they go in the steam tunnels, and then he tries to kill everybody, and, and, and it was totally made up. Some people conflate it. There was a guy named Dallas Egbert III who went missing in the steam tunnels of uh, Michigan University, something like that, and, and he went to go kill himself with drugs. And when they were searching for him, they found like a D and D book in his room. And the private detective listed ten things that might be, and somewhere in the middle it said, "Well, maybe he thought he was a D and D player and, and got lost." And so people conflated this and this together. And none, none of that was, you know, it had nothing to do with D and D. He was a drug addict, um, and he was found a month later. He, he failed to kill himself with his drugs, and they found him elsewhere. But this is something that people have gotten in there. It's in the, the culture. I've seen it referenced in uh, TV shows and other things like that, too. So here's the, the most typical controversy and myths that you'll hear. 
that D&D &D and role-playing games will make you commit suicide, commit murder, make you more violent in real life. You're, you're doing all this violence here, you're gonna go do it in real life. Uh, that they're, you know, they have no purpose or meaning to them. He says, get a life, you know, on there. Uh, lead you to the occult and devil worship, will lead you away from Christianity and such. Uh, it's for people with no social skills and will make you antisocial in the layman term of antisocial. All players are dorks, nerds, geeks, and losers that can't succeed in real life and live in their mother's basement. Okay. I can refute a lot of that. Okay, this is this is a matter of opinion and perspective, so you know, that, that's something else. Um, so a lot of hype. Patricia Pauling formed, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons, yes. There was an organization called Bad, just like Mad and Rad and the others, uh, after her son killed himself. And she was, she would go to police departments all over the country and train police officers on how to identify the dangers of a role-playing game so that you would know to how to arrest, if you saw they were a gamer, you should arrest them, take them to their parents, inform them about the dangers of role-playing gaming, confiscate all of their gaming material in a safe way to handle the material. This was part of her training program. So, <laughs> um, so they claim that increased the risk of suicide. Uh, so Patricia Pulling and then Dr. Radecki, and Radecki was also linked to a lot of the anti-violence uh, TV stuff. So Radecki was one of the official sources. He was a psychiatrist in the U.S., but it should be noted in 92, he had his license revoked for malpractice. He kept appealing and he finally got it back in 2002, revoked again in 2012, and now he's been arrested in 2013 uh, for trading prescription drugs for sex. Uh, but this was the guy they used as the reference material for the evils, uh, dangers. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of where the source was. But up till that point, he was on television and Congress and elsewhere testifying with Patricia Foley about why it should be banned from the market. They went to the Federal Trade Commission. They went to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. They wanted to label it that it would state, it would say, where hazardous could cause suicide. So this is prior to the video games getting their way. So some meta-analysis was done, taking all the data that the, the claimants were making about the risks of suicide, and comparing that to, to, you know, to the known gamers, and to non-gamers, and looking at the rates. And if that's all the suicides that were caused by role-playing gaming, because they claim to have the largest database of that information, then that would mean that role-playing gamers have one-tenth the risk of suicide of, of, of their peers which actually might be true. It's tricky with meta-analysis because you get these huge data sets and make all sorts of assertions, but that is one of the possible outcomes. Further research has definitely refuted the increased risk in actually using it for uh, treatment in uh, some disciplines because it helps build a social network. It's creative, it builds problem-solving skills rather than the no way out but suicide approach. And for some people it's cathartic, et cetera. Um, and there are a number of case studies using role-playing games to treat uh, suicidal individuals specifically. Um, so here's uh, some quick, I'm not going to read through the whole thing again, you can look through it there or online in detail, but these are specific excerpts of specific studies. So this is from the Journal of Psychotherapy in uh, uh, 1994, I actually just pulled it up in 2008, and then I replicated there, in the abstract. Depressive suicide, schizoid personality, 19-year-old male, not responding to traditional therapies. Those of us in TR can appreciate that's a significant statement to look for. Um, so use D&D &D as a bridge to help him develop communication between he and the doctor, and open up and analyze his relationships and what was working, what wasn't working. Become a, become aware of what happens, you know, in the fantasy setting, and then applying that as learning lessons to real relationships and improve his socialization, empathy, and communication skills in a safe manner. He was able to deal with some anger issues with his father, all these things ended up, ended up being very productive. Now, one caveat is, like many other activities, is you can take anything too far. It's always about balance, and so like anything, you can become too obsessive, and that's the only caveat you can add was making sure that, you know, there's a balance to it and doing other activities as well. So, Reinforced, more studies, again, reinforcing that not only does it not cause suicide, it actually <coughs> seems to be the antithesis because it is a social a cooperative problem solving game. Um, so another one was that it would make you homicidal or more violent. And 
there have been people trying to claim the D and D defense repeatedly in court. They say, well, I killed him because I was in a fugue state or something, and I thought I was like D and D character. That's why I killed my family. This, this has happened in multiple uh, uh, court cases. Not once has that ever been accepted. <laughs> not, a, not a single judge has accepted it. And other than Radecki that I mentioned earlier, most psychiatrists, psychologists wouldn't go down that road at all. And studies on gamer personality traits, behavioral tendencies, criminal history, antisocial behavioral surveys have disproved any such heightened risk. It's just the numbers don't match at all for it. They tend to have a lower criminal tendencies for some reason. Again, we could look at, we can theorize, but again, the problem is causality versus correlation. But the correlation is, for some reason, tabletop role-playing gamers seem to have a much lower criminal rate than non-tabletop non peers. And they've done some regression analysis, and it doesn't, there's, A, there's no correlation to increased criminality, and B, that it's the inverse on psychoticism their peers, if, they, if their peers scored high on psychoticism, that showed a very high likelihood of criminal behavior, and role-playing gamers didn't score high on that, and didn't show that information, so it's a little more. And again, there's about 70 of these studies. Um, so I covered that with the inverse correlation. So, but because of the efforts of the, the few groups, Bad and Rudecki and Poling and such, <coughs> It's kind of been inculcated in our culture. And you've seen it on Big Bang Theory, uh, Community, and a lot of others, and they make interesting representations of, of tabletop role-playing games and, and cultural references. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any correlation. Like, same thing with the occult and Satanism. Uh, not only does it not seem to be a tendency to go into that, the personality types don't match, the interests do not match. Um, also, meaningless for some reason, and this was a bunch of college students. Uh, Non-role-playing gaming college students, 46% of them scored high on meaninglessness in their test, but only 17% of gamers. Again, some interesting correlation stuff, needs more research to figure out exactly why. There's lots of theories, we're just throwing some of those out there. Um, the only alienation they've kind of felt has been from these attacks from people, and like, oh, you're a dweeb and a geek for being a role-playing gamer, and that kind of social, social stigma, but other than that, there's not the tendency to be more withdrawn or antisocial, just the antithesis, the social thing. Uh, so this is an analysis I did on their paper, and it covers the more in detail about the meaninglessness and, and the different aspects of it, that's available online. And I'll just put those there, and the whole thing. Long essays, Emily knows I, I don't have trouble writing long essays. <laughs> uh, and I have uh, about 13, 15 essays online on these topics, as well as a couple of slide slow pre slideshow presentations and one specifically on this topic of the uh, attacks and such, if you want to get more detail. So this is something like, well, who cares? It's like, what, 20 people play role-playing games? Well, actually, yeah, the peak is 20, 30 million. It's 8 to 12 million in the US back in 2000. That was the last time a survey was done. And then LARP is a few million. And then there's outside of the U.S. a few millions more. We don't really know exactly how many role-playing gamers there are, but it's it's a fair number of people. Not to use. And of course, throwing video games. Well, you throw in video games. That's 200 to 480 million role-playing gamers, computer-based role-playing games that are paying. This is just the paying ones. This isn't all the free Rune Quest and all these other things. This is just the ones people are paying for. They spent 3.8 billion dollars in 2009 on just video game role-playing games. Now you can see that's the U.S. And then, you know, 270 million, 250 million, you know, a few million here, a few million there. Quote uh, some congressmen from the 80s. Uh, so key aspects of role-playing games. Imagination and creativity, especially creative solutions to challenges. Uh, just some obvious skills. Uh, the players assume the roles of a character. It's a key aspect, usually a fictional setting, although it can be a fictional occurrence in a real setting. There's historical role-playing games. Uh, they control the character's actions within a narrative setting. There's some sort of story-driven connectedness to it. So it isn't just individual activities. There's a connected story. And it's interactive and collaborative storytelling. Suspension of disbelief is pretty important. You need to be able to be in the moment, enjoying that game, and kind of set aside the rest of the world for the moment. 
and then players make decisions to determine what courses of action may be available to characters. Now, action is either representational or actual, depending upon the format. Uh, case tabletop, it's uh, purely representational. You don't actually get up and swing your sword. You just say, my character swings a sword, and, and then sees what happens. Um, LARP, they might swing a foam sword at them, or blob something like them. Computer-based, they might click a mouse to make it swing a sword or something like that. Uh, it can be as simple as not taking action. Just, I'm going to be quiet right now. I'm in the courtroom of the king, and I don't want to open my mouth, and that's what I have my character do, remain silent, or saying something, or searching for something, or picking it up. There's all sorts of possibilities. So it's within a narrative context with structured rules systems. That's another key important aspect is those structured rules. And these rules and the setting allows players to exceed their natural abilities. It allows them to do things in a safe manner, especially with tabletop and, and computer-based. LARP gets a little bit more into their actual abilities, although there, there's some extension from there. Um, but they can do more than they can normally do in the real world and experience the consequences of that, both good and bad, and learn from that. And the characters in a real RPG evolve and develop. They don't just stay flat. They don't just keep using the same statistics and the same things happen to the character and it changes the character and that changes how the character interacts with the world going forward. Um, and then a lot of times players will learn from those experiences from watching other characters do. So there's the, the four types, Choose Your Own Adventure. I'm going to be using these abbreviations a lot. CYOA for Choose Your Own Adventure. Tabletop role playing, I'll use interchangeably RPG or TRPG. Computer based CRPG. Uh, I'll try not to hit you with too many of these other acronyms, but I will use MORPEG as a word <laughs> uh, frequently when we talk about computer based. And then live action role playing or LARP. Just a little bit of overlap from other areas recreation therapy, role play therapy, which is a thing. They kind of Role-playing game therapy, I think, kind of overlaps a lot of both of those areas. And then some of the different aspects it overlaps with recreation. Lots of places use it for education. There's a lot of learning process in it. There appears to be therapeutic benefit and, of course, socialization. This is the social part of most things. Lots of different disciplines touch on and can use or, or role-playing derives from. There's kind of that intershared relationship of these different disciplines. So, Abaddon. I love, what I love when I come across this, this is, this is really inspiring. So, the uh, interaction patterns, and this is in, I think it's in the cookbook, right? Um, oh, yeah, so, uh, talks, so for role playing gaming, can't really do like the, how many of you are familiar with the Abaddon interaction patterns? None? Oh. Okay, so this is basically how a person interacts with the world and objects around them, and Abaddon tried to isolate them to seven or eight different patterns. And, and, and so it's in the, the TR cookbook, breaks it down and gives commentary on it. And it's, it's really, this was an aha moment when I read it. It was like, when you get to your secret role playing game, it, just, it really fits. So, for the first one, it's pretty much meditation and fantasizing. It's all internal for the inter-individual. You're not doing it to the outside world. Not a whole lot we can do as you know, recreation therapists and, and, and others. However, they can, let's say they're fantasizing about their next session. They're thinking about what their character might be doing. or They play out scenarios in their head of how, oh, I should have done that differently. So there are, it, it wouldn't be something you'd start out with, but as you go through other sessions, this could tie in uh, in between. It could be something to ask them about. So, when the week happened, did you think about or experience anything that reminded you of your previous session, the gaming session that came up in real life, which I had happened with gamers many times. Um, and they're like, well, this didn't happen, but boy, you know, I was thinking about it, I dreamed about this happening, and I really wish it had gone this way. And so that's where that can kind of tie in, just that internal locus there. Extra individual, extra individual. Uh, action directed by a person toward an object on the environment requiring no contact with another person. Uh, and I, these are excerpts from the book. And um, why it's important is because, as you know, a lot of people with disabilities and illnesses can be isolated at home, and this can give them some activities to do something productive rather than just sit in front of a TV or completely veg out. Um, and so the applicable, what I'm doing here with RPG application is I'm listing the types of role-playing games that would be applicable for this interaction pattern. So we have Choose Your Own Adventure, Solo, so S-RPG, Solo, uh, solo role-playing games, 
and solo computer-based role-playing games. Now, solo role-playing game is interesting adaptation. So they make modules for gaming adventures so you don't have to do it on yourself. Well, they have these solo versions that some of you remember, I grew up with these, these little markers that would reveal the invisible ink. Mm -hmm. And so then it would reveal, you go, you read a description, and it says, there's only the slightest whisper of leather on stone as you move down the corridor. You use invisible ink marking pen to fill in any one box for every level of your character. So you fill it in, and then if any number is less, so that's a randomization if you don't have dice. For any number is less than or equal to your move silently percentage, go to entry 81. If all the numbers are greater, go to entry 82, and then you mm -hmm. see what happens. And there's a, you creep around the corner in time to see a man step into the hallway and walk toward you. And then it asks another question, another question. So it's a little bit of a way to play the game yourself. It's you know not as free form, obviously, as other forms. But it gives somebody, even with the mapping, they do the same thing where you can reveal parts of the map as you go. So there's a creative way to come up with solo versions. Aggregate. So this is side by side and parallel activities. So a lot of times it'd be like crafts, you know, painting a bunch of ceramic figures or something like that. And um, with with role playing gaming, there's choose your own adventure. You could have a group of people each playing either different or same choose your own adventure books. Maybe afterwards you could discuss it, do some processing about it, etc. Solo role playing games, you could have a group of people playing the video games. And again, you, you know, from a TR perspective, you always want to go, okay, they're playing a game, now what? As they go through the adventure, and some of them did well and some of them didn't do well, well, why? Well, what did you do for them? And now they can discuss it to try it together and do some of that processing and learning from that. And then the solo, the solo role-playing games that I point out there. Also, a popular side activity for role-playing games, is, for tabletop specifically, is making and painting miniatures. And they come in all sorts of different sizes. Um, and a lot of people will spend hours and hours and hours painting these things um, and in great detail. Uh, before my eyes started to get weaker, I was painting like eyelashes looking for 25 millimeter characters without a magnifying glass. Now I can't even use it. Uh, so those are great parallel activities, and again, processing is a key aspect. Inter-individual, uh, competitive nature, so you're going to see this more with, I throw in collectible card games just as a side, but um, you have player versus player tabletop, which isn't very common, but happens sometimes. Player versus player computer-based happens a lot online, and uh, also player versus player LARP. So less the tabletop, more of the computer and live action can do player versus player. There's already plenty of competitive games out there anyway, but it's something to be aware of if, if somebody prefers role playing games that you want them to build some more of a competitive nature. Um, then there is the unilateral, which is competitive nature of three or more against one, so whoever's it. Um, really have to be careful with this one, as the book states, uh, because if somebody, whoever's it, doesn't have the skills for the rest of the group, they're going to be it forever. That's not going to be a positive experience for them. This can also apply to larger more peg, tabletop, etc. Although again, not so much, not commonly. Uh, multilateral, competitive, basically it's a free for all, everybody against everybody. Uh, you may need your clients to work up to this because it's pretty high demand because you've got everybody against you everywhere, whatever it is, whether it's physical or, or imaginary, and the different types of formats. So here's the big one. This is when I went, oh, this is perfect, and especially in a, in a few slides. Quotes. I'm going to quote quite a bit for this particular section because it fits beautifully the tabletop. Introvert. Action of a cooperative nature by two or more persons intent upon reaching a mutual goal. Action requires positive verbal and nonverbal interaction. Tabletop role playing gaming, especially. You do see it with more pegging, you do see it with LARP. The tabletop, this is where it really shines. Learning how to cooperate and function as a group is difficult but important. And it's essential that they develop these skills. And a lot of people who have the long-term you know, disabilities and illnesses, that's a number one factor. It's really hard to get them to work with other people. And this is a great activity, you know, a format. Not forget role-playing gaming, just this interaction is just a great activity. Unfortunately, uh, as important as it is for development, um, and it's acknowledged that there's a lot of competitive activities um, and not enough cooperative, there's not that many cooperative tabletop, for example, activities. And even, even if you have a good one, it's difficult to motivate the, uh, different clients to want to participate in that. 
some people are more easily motivated by competition and such. Trying to do cooperative, you're trying to get all these different interests and get everybody on the same page. Working together is quite challenging. But the benefits are significant. Um, and, and the book goes on at length about that. Then there's intergroup, so this is group versus group, this is team sports, things like that. Uh, and basically, you don't usually see that at all in tabletop, uh, but you would see it with LARP and more pets and such, group versus group, things like that. Two different adventure books. They're basically very simple if-then statements. We give you a little bit of example for Solo. These are some of the originals, this is book number five in a series of about 80 books that first started in the 80s. Um, and basically, it starts out very, and these were targeted for about nine to 12 year olds, but they also have some for a little younger that can be read to little children, or they have some that are a little bit more mature for a little bit older teenagers and adults. Um, and so they give you a basic scenario, they give you usually some sort of action situation, and then, let's just show you turn the page till, you reach a section, so uh, a fellow meets you and uh, suggests that you should go visit Dr. Lopez, um, or maybe just ignore them and go right to uh, Chichen Itza, because you're on the path searching for something, this is the mystery of the Maya. And so if you decide to visit Dr. Lopez, turn to page 7, if you decide to go right to Chichen Itza, turn to page 38, jump to that and give you a different result. So now this book, you can read, you can make different choices many times. And they actually, a lot of them list, like this one has, says choose from 39 endings. Some of them have 150 different endings. So all these different, you can try and experiment, and, like, and what do you have to lose? Like, oh, I'll go back and start over. So really safe way to experiment and see what different choices have consequences uh, in the way. Then some up the ante a little bit. They actually include a little bit of a character sheet to keep track of some stats. Some of them include little maps so you can track where your character is going through. So this gets a little bit more into the solo role playing, but it's building on that whole choose your adventure thing. And same thing here. So those are just some examples to look at. So tabletop seems to be the one that's the least understood and has the most misunderstanding, at least that I've, that I've run into people. Um, can we start up as interactive storytelling with structured rules? It's really important about structured rules. We realize that it's just improv and, and such. Uh, you create characters uh, on paper. You usually have a game master, narrator, referee, who acts as a writer, director, referee in this imaginary, verbal-only setting. It's kind of similar to childhood, let's pretend, like cops and robbers and such, but uh, key differences. You're not wearing costumes or props. Uh, it's really just you know a friendly group of people having fun, sitting down, use their imaginations, verbally work together, collaboratively creating a story overcoming imaginary challenges, and achieving goals in a structured way. Uh, Justice Spatsky talks about the importance of children needing to play, not compete, and uh, not over-structuring all, all of their options, and uh, she has an essay on that, it's interesting to read. Um, as I said, there aren't that many social tabletop recreation activities that are cooperative in nature. Lots and lots of competitive ones, not that many cooperative. And, but role-playing gaming is by design cooperative. The relationship with the, with the game master is not competitive. It's not hostile. It's supportive and, and, and uh, promotes. Everybody has fun when everybody's doing well, including the game master. Now, when things break down in any scenario, if people become hostile to the referee or whatever, that's a problem. But that's you know, something that skills, you can develop skills as a referee to handle that or just that's the master. All you need, players, game master, somebody has a little more experience than the players. Some sort of randomizing <laughs> agent. Uh, some people use cards, some people use rock, paper, scissors, um, and then of course the most common is polyhedral dice or just even just six-sided dice if you just have some from like a Yahtzee set or something. Uh, some paper, some pencils, comfortable seating location, and then some sort of rules to structure to follow. Uh, there are published adventure modules, so that if you don't want to, if, if you're new to it, and you don't want to create your own adventures, you can just go out and buy them. They're inexpensive, and they're ready to go. And all you need to do is read through, be prepared, and then you can run the games. Also, there are battle maps and drawing boards, and people make terrain and all sorts of other things. Kind of just kind of keep track in complex situations. They're moving their miniatures through, and say, "Well, I'm off to the left, I'm off to the right." And with younger groups or more less socially mature groups. 
uh, it's useful to get less of, well, I was over here. No, I was there. No, I was behind him. No, I was in front of him. So it's helpful to have those miniatures on the battle map so that he feels really awesome. Uh, for a more mature group, it's not a productive exercise. I was going to read through an example of Zillow Interactive, but actually there's a great video clip and it's under Creative Commons and it's actually a group, I was in a small film of it too. So I'm just going to play another short clip. Again, I'm afraid the video is not going to show up. I'm going to try to switch it to here and see if it here. will. Uh, player's Handbook. It's got uh, all the rules, everything you need to know. Thanks, Kevin. I'll look it over. Hey, all right. That's everybody. Okay. Now, this is a mid-level campaign, so we'll be starting at ninth level. I flipped through that handbook. I think I got the gist of it. It doesn't seem that hard. Let's see your character, then. Um, what's, uh, what's her strength bonus? She doesn't have one. Her highest stat is her intelligence. I put her other bonuses in dexterity and charisma. I put her other feats in speed and precision. That's why intelligence is more important than strength. They would be if you were a wizard, but you're not. You're a fighter. A fighter with a giant kill me sign on her back. With her charisma, she should be able to talk her way out of most fights. Gary, character. I'm a wild mage. Wild! Leo, I assume you're playing a fighter again? Actually, I'm going as a bard. Really? That's a bit of a jump for you. You've only played fighters before. I'm playing a monk. What's he going to do, copy manuscripts? Think <laughs> Kung Fu monk, grasshopper. Oh. All right. <laughs> oh, I'm also playing an elf. You get in the throne room, where three of you have answered a summons. So you get a little idea there. Um, it's a great little intro. It's called Gamers 2 Dorcas Rising. There's a whole series of these. They're freely available on YouTube. It was the gamers. They were college student movie theater uh, students in Vancouver and Seattle area. They got together. And then they had funding for Gamers 2, and they were actually allowed by Wizards of the Coast to use D&D, &D, and that's why they showed a little promotional thing. They actually got to do some of it in the, the offices. And then they recently did Gamers 3 <clears throat> as well, and it includes... Uh, collectible card games as well as role play games and, and all that. Uh, again, that's all freely available. Anyways, I heavily edited that just to keep it on point because there's a lot of gamer jokes in there that aren't. Um, and I included what I love is her point about the stereotypes about fighters having to be big and burly and brown and purple. Dumb. Forest A, level one, and, room four, um, she brought up a great point that no, there's intelligence and wits and dexterity and other ways, and, and they show throughout the movie how that actually was more beneficial than just mm -hmm. pure brawn. So, and you know, the skepticism of the guy was just <laughs> so typical. All right, I'm gonna skip this because we, we went, uh, uh, did the video instead. Uh, and uh, I think we'll call it there for the night. What? It's still early. It's after two. It's what? I had no idea it was so late. See? See what happens? You get so into it, you can't help but lose track of time. Yeah, just like so that wonderful flow experience. Uh, so the, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but that one of the aspects is the loss of time. Either they're so into it, the challenge level is just <laughs> right, they're not bored and they're not overwhelmed, and the next thing you know, they look up and two hours have gone by, and you've been having a great time and it's just a great state to be in, which can be very useful for achieving therapeutic goals. They may be doing something hard for them, and they forget it's hard because they're in that moment. So computer-based formats, some of them going back for some of us many years back, Zork, which is text-based, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, text-based. Jumping forward, we have Dragon Age Skyrim. These are solo-type games, generally. Um, and then there's the multi-user type, Mush, Mud, Moo, Morpeg. Ultima Online, Eve, Baldur's Gate, and, Wood, and World of Warcraft is the granddaddy of those. Also, Lord of the Rings Online, Dungeons and Dragons Online. They can alternate some between solo and multiplayer to different degrees. One of the things, whether they're offline or online, an important thing with clients is whether it's real time or turn based. Turn based will wait for user input. So, if you have somebody who isn't able to respond quickly, it will wait for them. Some have set timers, and those will just wait indefinitely. And even with multiplayer, they have those where the next player can't proceed until the first player has made their choice. So that's an important consideration uh, for people who may not be able to have the reflexes for real-time games. Luckily, there's lots of those out there. And that's plenty of TR professors and such who say any screen time is bad. Uh, uh, 
any TV is bad. Some of them don't have haven't had TVs in 20 years in their in their rooms. Some are more accepting of the Wii because of its physicality and its interaction. And I personally find most of the computer games kind of lacking compared to the, the LARP and tabletop, the more social ones. But lots of people enjoy them, and they, and they do have uses. Lots of people do need to cut back on their screen time, no doubt about it. Um, but for some people, like TBI and neuroplasticity, it might be all they can do at, at certain stages of, of recovery. So it may and, you know, it can trigger that creativity and problem solving with minimal interaction. Might not be a bad thing to consider. There have been a number of research studies trying to figure out what's the healthy amount of screen time. Right now it seems to be about 30, 60 minutes actually seems to be good for you on a daily basis, arguably. Start to break two hours, it starts to become detrimental when the things go the other direction. So here's some citations, and I'm going to skim through these fairly quickly. And then the packet, this will be on the website. Uh, but basically talking about the benefits, the changes in the brain from even playing just like Mario 64, it actually can develop more brain material and such in a beneficial way. Improve memory and navigational ability. A quick way of rating types of gamers, killers, achievers, explorers, socializers, depending upon your different preferences. It's an oversimplification, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, diagram. Uh, we talked about people dressing up in costumes, seeing each other's foam swords or video games. Well, that's closer to LARP. Most people think of this, combat LARP. <laughs> That's a lot of people. That's all people. That's not a cornfield. That's people all over the trees. And they, these happen all over the world in, in huge amounts, sometimes thousands of people in a single event. Uh, or this, or this. So that's what most people think of with LARP. However, that's not the only kind of LARP. There's plain clothes, no costume at all. There's the costume type with props. And then there's ones with combat. Well, plenty of them without combat. But people see the ones out there fighting more. They're more visible. Uh, some quotes from Wikipedia's, some quotes, references that I just thought were interesting. Uh, Western culture moved towards participatory arts. I thought that was a great summary of each of these. It's not passive, we're not watching the theater, we're not watching the movie, we're not watching the TV. We're participating in the story. And so LARP and others are co-creators of the game. Uh, it's a shared experience. It's been growing with geek culture and such, but it isn't limited to that. And um, compared to video games, which is really commercialized and commoditized, uh, LARP is, can kind of people just go to fabric places and make their own things, etc. It isn't as commercialized. Although there are commercial products. The Nerf now makes foam weapons and such. My kids have some of these and, uh, that are available out there, but it, that's a small amount. And uh, gender balance is pretty good uh, in that as well. Uh, and actually, a lot of computer-based is, but there's some issues with, with that too. And I've actually done a study on the gender balance uh, biases and such experiences in the uh, different uh, markets. So this is the third movie. I'm actually right there. <laughs> um, and it's just kind of an illustration of kind of a non-combat LARP where stuff's being acted out. But there are some people in costume, even though it's a scene from a movie. And pirates, why? Oh, because everything's better with pirates. That's a reference from one of the other movies, but some people love pirates, and I'm a pirate there, too. So. Uh, this is a LARP scene. If we cannot come to some accord, find some way to trust each other and form a united front, then Ikshasa will reach the Godhead's seat, and an age of darkness will consume us all. And out of character, that means questing is dead, and I'd rather not have that happen on my watch. The Tuatha will join the alliance with Holden. If, if you hand over the traitor, Dundareel. You do not represent the Tuatha. You speak for the Unseelie. The Unseelie won the war, and so we are the Tuatha. The price for our cooperation is your Seely Prince. Never. Nice timing, by the way. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Did someone mention prices? We of Esh are listening. What Malkior needs is food. Yet you build your kingdom on a mountaintop. Food or land? Give us a farming province. We'll send you an army. No, sell it to us. We'll give you a good price. Why should it fall to us to fight the dreaded army? It's clear whose fault this is. Arcanix, 
They shattered the new mountain with their magics and exposed the sea. You will not put this on us. No. Excuse me. You provoked them with your crazy magics. That pyramid was underwater until you woke them up. And now that we have awoken, you are all doomed. If you want our help, it might be wise not to insult us. All of you, all do. It's Cinnamon's fault, it's yours. The city cling bomb was supposed to destroy the seat entirely. Cut our sand dudes, hope to goods. What? What? Masio, Lord, Fusca Gex, Keith, up to call Sando a car. Dude, seriously, those costumes are unreal. You guys went all out. Kiba Gek, Omak Tagaka. Chagagax Gadzur, Kazagax Lordzuts Va. Okay, a little too into it. Barely sit down the hotel. I'm so glad you came. I was hoping you'd come. Why, uh, why aren't you wearing a costume? Oh, uh, I am. I'm LARPing as a guy who hates LARPing. Oh! She's behind me, isn't she? Yeah, you direct me. Look, this may look stupid to you, but it's one of the highlights of my year. So if you're gonna be a colossal, get up in the corner. Where were we? Oh, uh, you were belittling yes. us. So much for your vaunted technology. We didn't see you complaining when our A-bomb blew up the God King. Mm. And that was our last chance to get home. We'd help, miss. But there's just too few of us. We can't risk open warfare and leave the home states undefended. What about your neighbors? Would they be of any help? Huh. The Who Gem? You remember the God King? Err. We will have no dealings with the displaced. Let the dead take them. But if one of us falls, we all fall. The strong of faith will prevail. Forget it. You waste of time. You really need to get over this minor dispute with the displaced. Minor dispute? They killed our god. And we do it again. Not helping. <laughs> you make my time. Awesome. All right, cool. Thank you. Did you, did you win? It, it's a LARP. Oh, so you all lost. <laughs> In each of these envelopes is a potential future for the nine empires. Little, the idea is showing the inclusiveness of all ages there um, and uh, the interaction. Yes. Um, so for the video, obviously they scripted that. Is LARPing? LARPing can scripted? be either or. Sometimes there's some scripting, like Vampire, Masquerade, sometimes there's some scripting. Most of the time it's free form. This was for a specific movie, um, so uh, there is some uh, scripting for that. But generally it would be. That would be, they'd be making that as they go. They, they went, well, this history happened and we're discussing it and here's the debate and, and let's work this out. They're trying to come to consensus against another group that's wiping out all their forces. And they're trying to unite all the other factions that have hurt each other in the past to try to, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and you know, together. So that's what, that's what that was playing out. And that would be done in an improv way. Um, and then there would be rules and structure um, on who gets to go when and, and if there was combat, how they would use one all of that. This is something interesting in the area. They do annual zombie walks <laughs> through the streets. Not not full blown LARPing, but it, they a lot of there's a lot of overlap in those. All right, um, pros and cons of the different formats. So choose your own adventure. Accessible to wide population, flexible time commitment, well structured, reusable. However, it's not social unless it's read aloud by another, and even then it's minimally. Uh, the strictly structured setting isn't as flexible, so it's not. Not open ended as much. Uh, doesn't really allow for character development, although they've tried to improve that. Does require, of course, language skills and matching it and reading skills unless somebody's reading it to them. 
Uh, Computer-based role-playing gaming, readily available in many styles, formats, and genres and titles. Very popular and more culturally accepted now. It used to be, but more mainstream now. And more so than tabletop and live action. More flexible than choose your own adventure. Online versions can join with friends and family. People do make new friends all the time that way. Uh, and it's easy to find games to join other people. Research is showing about one hour a day seems to be good for brain development. Uh, and role-playing games even more so than just the video games themselves. Uh, can help bedridden or xenophobic participants connect with the world when they would otherwise normally be socially isolated behind a safety screen to work on them. I've had some tabletop gamers who haven't left their, I, I had one man left his house in seven years, and he, he finally wanted to try a tabletop. And he was able to migrate from the computer base, which is familiar enough to take the chance in a small room in a supportive environment, and he joined it, and he was playing every week. And uh, he said he always had anxiety, you know, leaving his house and getting there, and it was, you know, he was, way to go, we're glad to see you, and uh, you're welcoming. Uh, gamers see a lot of them. I, when I did the research at the convention, I was surprised. Um, I was doing a gender bias study on, on gamers, and I approached over 200 people and I said, have you ever participated in any kind of role-playing game? They said, yes, would you fill out this questionnaire? If no, then they didn't qualify. That's all I said, and I had the questionnaire. So out of over 200 I approached, uh, there were 167 that said yes to be role-playing gamers. Only three said no. We had 164 respondents to fill out these questionnaires, and 25% of them added comments on the back, too. Um, so and they were very friendly. I was really amazed at how warm it was. This was at multiple conventions, as well as some game stores and some game, uh, smart game settings. Some cons of computer-based, not physically active. Look, we kind of mixes that up a little bit. There are studies about higher levels of obesity, not just because of the lack of activity, but because of the cortisol levels and such that are contributing to that. Uh, offline versions, versions not social, although there can be some that are specifically to work on specific skills at a fundamental level. Online community can be rough. Uh, some of those, some of you may have heard of Gamergate last year. Um, they attacked a specific figure in the computer gaming world, uh, Felicia Day. They published her personal address and all this, or made all kinds of threats and really, really bad blow up, and it's, it's created this debate. Um, so that's some of the risks of the online world in general, and, but you know, that can happen. Although computer-based games are about now 50-50, and depending on the genre, like Sims Online is 80% female. Uh, shooters are about 43% uh, female and then the rest male, so they're, they're almost balanced. And then uh, role-playing games online are about 50-50 on the gender balance. Uh, maybe a little bit more female actually than male role-playing games. Uh, they usually don't encourage strong communication skills, a lot of the companies to make profits build in, I need to rephrase this, I've been told, but uh, <laughs> grinding and hooking. Uh, it, these are game terms for grinding away like killing boars to earn experience points to get more powerful and then really narrow defined plot hooks to make you go this way. And they, and they make you go through all these before you get, so they make it less free form. And it actually is meant by design, they've used sociologists, psychologists for, for addictive like behavior patterns. It's just built into the video games. Um, Video games can cost now easily 60 bucks a game. Many of them now have monthly fees, gaming hardware, etc. Online and on the mini can lead to people acting up and not doing their best behavior. Pros of uh, tabletop uh, cooperative gameplay rather than the competitiveness of computer and LARP. Very social, it is social by nature. Accessible to a wide range of populations. The only issue is communication barrier, but there's a lot of ways to overcome that. And um, it's inexpensive, encourages creativity, uh, unlimited flexibility of options, it's only limited by your imagination. Uh, it's fairly easy to find players and groups in smaller cities or larger, a little tougher in smaller areas. Uh, all you need is a place to sit down uh, comfortably and share, very little equipment needed, usually just paper, pencil, dice, some books. Uh, and it triggers a lot of interest in a lot of other areas, history, literature, cartography, painting, sculpting, metallurgy, physics. Uh, my son youngest one is studying physics and he was trying to understand about how lasers work and how much energy it would take to drive a laser to do X, Y, Z which is a specific story of mine. Um, and then miniature painting and terrain building and all these other ancillary activities get triggered by it. Not physically active, yes? Well, did you want to talk about uh, assessments as a I'm, pro? I'm throwing that in right towards the end and okay. squeezing it in. So not physically active, <coughs> difficult to find players and groups in smaller towns. Uh, there is still some of the societal stigma when you bring it up, sometimes outright hostility, uh, video clips, 
etc., requires, though, social communication across the problem solving skills, at least at a fundamental level. If they don't have it at all, it breaks down. Um, but they, as long as they're going in with the, the somewhat of the attitude, then that can be built up and, and improved. But it does require that. Not everybody has that, so it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Uh, maybe use computer base or something else to work up to that or choose another venture. LARP is physically active, uh, for those that, that that's a positive, and uh, accessible wide range of populations. It often has teamwork, encourages creativity, problem solving skills, has that free form structure. Uh, usually competitive though, and many of them are combat centered, and that then requires them to have physical abilities and it's based heavily on their actual abilities. It's harder to make it beyond their abilities. Uh, somewhat expensive for equipment, hard to find groups, uh, except in large uh, metropolitan areas. Accommodations can be difficult, especially seasonal stuff. Can be difficult in the winter, and the stigma of being out there in costume and swords and such can have quite a reaction to people. Yes. I'm trying to imagine what happens. Yes. And how long is it? Is it a couple hours? Does it last? You know, to be continued. Next time we get together, we'll conclude this game. Can it can be that? Then actually, yeah. So it can be any duration from 30 minutes to 60 minutes is kind of a minimum. Um, and then you usually do like a continuation each time, although there are some that you could try to hurry and wrap up in a very short session. It is possible to do very short mini adventures. Two, I've had campaigns last five years where we met every weekend and with mostly the same group, there's a little bit of change in the people. the same character. They generally say the same character. So his character gets killed, they make a new one and join as a different character, but it's the same player. Mm -hmm. and, and they advance and it's all this history and everything built up over five years. It's amazing. Uh, looking at it. So it's completely flexible on the duration. Um, and, and you can make it all wrap up in one session, or span a couple of sessions, or make it ongoing and open it. Um, some specific examples I'm going to just skim through. Uh, again, I, the resources are available to read them in more detail. Traumatic brain injury, autism spectrum toddlers, ASD adults, and uh, youth and adults, and then the deaf community, so we're well the deaf community. Um, so there's a full slideshow of the TBI, so I'm going to actually go and skip through it if you, if you want to check that online. But basically, it's progressive. You start out with choosing an adventure, reading it to them as they're coming out of, the, you know, the functioning is just slowly improving. Use just either eye blink or hand squeeze responses and read it to them and walk them through to try to get through that in short sessions. Then if they get some motion and some vision, maybe a, a mouse or a polymorphic adapter, they interact with a turn-based computer to work on the Again, trigger getting as much of that activation for neuroplasticity as you possibly can um, through that. So I'm going to just skip through that. <laughs> yes, those are the different sets. And then increasing the tabletop as they begin to develop communication skills, and then live action for the more physical aspects. And in this case, this person ends up still paralyzed uh, from the waist down, so is uh, still having to use a wheelchair. So I have a little, it's a couple people who have marked their wheelchairs. Up. So this, <laughs> I meant to cut trim this down <laughs> too much of it. So there's a lot, and, and this is actually the short version. I have a whole, I think it's 20-minute presentation on the TBI uh, program using it. Is that available? Yes. Is that available online? It's all available online. It's on the RPG Research channel and on the RPGResearch.com website. Already up there. So then, like moving with their in motion improves, they can move to the Wii to use more activity. And then, as they're continuing to progress in physicality uh, and communication, there's tabletop, they pick up the dice and roll it, they try to write, do basic math, and of course, the cooperative narrative. Uh, so then, stage four, they're permanently uh, paralyzed. They have some movement issues, but here's what some people did. They steampunked their wheelchairs. <laughs> These are actual workers that did it. This is, Steampunk Professor Xavier from the, the comics. That's their interpretation of it. They did that for their chairs. <laughs> so the many potential benefits to, for the development. This was a flyer I did for the deaf community for uh, uh, ASL adapted role playing game. Um, just a quick flyer on that. This was I don't know if from one of the classes we were in. We did the activity with the toddlers, ASD toddlers. And it was, you know, different activity, jumping over jump ropes, jumping through hoops, but we tied together the story 
and then they would get one of these cards, like this would be, they'd save the king from the fire pits and tie it together with that share, the, the connected narrative. Some of them tracked it better than others, but it was fun to them. Use the different dice, they make different animal sounds, depending on how it landed on the ground. You know, they go, oh, you know, blank, blank, or something like that. <laughs> And so, then again, those are some articles. Then on this is for the Tacoma group. This is to learn to use the public transit system. They start out tabletop in a safe setting, learning, using the actual maps, but in a game setting. They're supposed to stop a virus from spreading through the bus system to turn it into zombies in Tacoma. Once they get the hang of the bus system, then we actually, they would go and actually use the bus and finish the adventure that way in a short live action non costume adventure. Educational programs in, in uh, different parts of the country. In Denmark, they have two years of high school all taught through LARP. They teach math, science, history, and three languages, all using LARP. Um, great little place to check out. Um, they recently got rid of their English language page, but luckily I archived it on my website, so you want to be able to read more about it. Renaissance Adventures down in the south, they do live action role playing with kids, uh, helps build confidence. Uh, Banty Workshops uh, works their educational workshops in California. Uh, all age groups of role playing gamers there. She's been doing that for 25 years. Um, she's a cancer survivor, if any of those that, 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 that connects with. Um, and she found it helped her through the, the hard times of that. Uh, Mythic RPG in Pennsylvania uh, they, is the tabletop version, and then they also have a LARP version for educational. Romach in Israel. Unfortunately, the store they were doing this in just closed, but this is the only fully therapeutic one in Israel. They had a, a therapist through a one-way mirror, watching the game, taking notes, and then interacting with the game master to adjust the adventure to meet specific needs of autism and other at-risk uh, teens in the game. So at each session, they target their specific needs. The Madonna group's trying to use role-playing games to help with victims of sexual abuse and the uh, perpetrators. Not, not at the same time or together, but using role-playing games to help them with their different issues. Uh, they're still working on developing that. Um, there's an article using it for, it's a bunch of other references, and here's your question about time. Okay. Start and session. Sessions are typically two to four hours for a tabletop, but again, they're totally flexible, um, and it depends on what you're trying to achieve, you know, how much time you have with it. Well, I know with the cards, which is good, you can try different ways. Right, but those are competitive, too, yeah. though, is the problem, so. But yeah, you, you, can, you can keep them down to one hour session. Um, so I've covered that. There's only two or three LARP groups I know of in Spokane. There's a dozen or so here in the greater Seattle area. These are some quick little testimonials from when I posted some of my previous stuff. Tabletop RPGs have helped quite a bit with my social anxiety because of the structured nature of interactions. It's easier for me to interact without anxiety when I can have a goal for an in-character conversation. Main thing, turning a socially, from a socially inept teen into a functional adult. Help the social skills, etc. So those are the really obvious ones, and there's all those ancillary benefits. And again, these were not therapeutic implementations. This was just the reversal implementation, and it seems to have that benefit. I'm working on this. <laughs> it's a hypothetical draft. It's based on the recreation therapy handbook practice. It's a blatant ripoff of, of the concept, but applying. Okay, how can role playing games fit into each of those with all the codes, with all our ICF and ICD codes and such? Work in progress, open to anybody to help with, if you're in the Creative Commons. <laughs> International General Role Playing, uh, just started a few years ago. Met, there's like 20 PhDs as, as part of the peer review process. Um, and they have about three or four issues so far. They've released one or two a year. And um, also, role playing games can work as a fun assessment, especially for kids, because it has built in assessment tools. You start out with all these statistics on the character sheets, and you'll see those character sheets there. They have name and, and different abilities. And then as you play, you get little increments. As you succeed at stuff, it automatically increments up those characters. And so over time, the character sheet can actually be an automatic assessment of how the players are progressing. And they don't realize they're actually they're kind of being assessed. And you can work in other more formal assessments into those tools in a fun way without being that formalized. And you get a lot of information from the sessions. Lots of different layouts and the different areas that it could address. You know, that's in those pronounced as well as online. All right, let's squeeze into the one minute or something. Sorry. But question answer, yes, please. Um, with RPGs, you know, they're a character and they're working on social skills, but 
safety at all or could it impact them negatively when they're interacting with people that, you know, they don't, they're in their, you know, real time and they're not in character and maybe the social skills might be a little bit off because they are so used to being in character. How do you see the differences for... Right. Well, so that's where you get into generalization. Can they generalize the skills they develop in one setting into a broader setting? And that's just part of any therapy that working them through that transitional stage. Of when you're in that bubble of therapy and you're really, really open, you know, at some point, some clients, obviously not those, well, then you don't want to be at the grocery store going, and this and this and this and just, you know, empty because people do have that trouble with that transition. Yeah. It's not even role playing, just therapy in general. So that is that is a, that is a process of you would want to process that with them, discuss appropriateness of okay, yes, you did this with this character. How would it be different in the real world, and what could you use in this, and what would be inappropriate? For you? You'd want to use that's where we as therapists come in, is that processing of it uh, for the appropriate boundaries. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. I was just saying that that was you know. Yeah, no, I, that, you know. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as I said, the biggest danger is the overly obsessive. Getting yeah. too focused, it's so much more fun than the real world. Who wants to come out of that, right? And that's just part of finding that balance and, and with, with any activity. Bill? Okay, again, um, this uh, slideshow will be online by the end of the day or so, um, and the video will probably in a few days. And a copy, so it'll be a P, it's a PDF. Of, some of you have physical copies. Will be available on the website. And always feel free to email or contact me. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be collecting the um, session evaluations over here as well as uh, stamping the PEU sheets. I do want to draw your attention. We get these forms mapping every year. Once we get them, we want to change them. But um, please note that one is strong.